Born from humble beginnings in Ashland, Kentucky, Naomi Judd was the daughter of a riverboat cook and a gas station owner. She put herself through school and worked as a nurse while she was a single mom in Hollywood, California, raising her two daughters all by herself. Naomi took a courageous chance and moved to Nashville to pursue a country music career with her daughter Winona. And in 1983, that move paid off. The Judds were discovered on The Ralph Emery Show and went on to release nothing but top 10 singles for the rest of the 1980s. 14 of them went all the way to number one. Things were looking up for Naomi. Then, in 1991, she was diagnosed with hepatitis C and given only three years to live. This horrifying diagnosis forced her to retire from the road, and though this was a devastating blow, Naomi has always been a survivor of adversity. She refused to accept a death sentence and not only lived those three years, she was declared cured of the disease five years later. Though she has outlived that alarming diagnosis, sold millions of albums, won five Grammys, and written several New York Times best-selling books. Naomi has been fighting a battle that millions of adults in the U.S. deal with every day. Her latest book, River of Time, tells some of the most intimate stories about her battle with severe depression and anxiety. She's a testament to the fact that mental illness does not discriminate by race, orientation, or level of success. Naomi hopes to reach some of those millions of people with her candid stories and methods for regaining hope. We are here outside of Nashville, Tennessee in the beautiful countryside. We are talking to country music royalty, Naomi Judd. Oh, stop. Oh, it's true. You have had... I do have some crowns, I have to admit. Oh. I have tiaras, like the first time we did a rodeo and the uh, sweet potato queen had this tiara about snatched it off her head. <laughs> and from then on, uh, Winona and Ashley and everybody started giving me tiaras and crowns, because they say I'm the queen of everything. I will admit that. Well, fair enough. <laughs> you have had 26 hit singles. You've sold over 20 million records. Hmm. You've worked as a nurse, a model, a secretary, mm -hmm. and now as a mental health awareness advocate. And I worked at a mental health store making smoothies. Oh, wow. Yeah, I've done a lot of things. Yeah. So we are here today to talk about your book, River of Time. Right. Paperback is out now, so mm -hmm. go pick that up. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about it? I had uh, severe depression, severe, severe. In fact, my doctor, my psychiatrist, said that I had, this was his diagnosis, severe, not mild or moderate, severe treatment resistant meaning they tried every drug, every antidepressant uh, on the market, severe treatment resistant depression. So this is as bad as it can possibly get. So I was really messed up. Uh, and people are shocked when they hear that because I'm usually laughing or, I mean, doing the bit, bent over double belly laugh and twisting and twirling and jumping off risers on stage and everything. But this is gonna shock you. There are 40 million of us, 40 million people with severe depression and panic disorder. I have panic disorder too. So because I care so much about the folks out there, which is really my um, background and where my heart is, um, I love the Heartland, little plug there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> In fact, I named one of our albums Heartland, but I felt like I had to tell them about what depression is so they can figure out if they've got it, so they can self-diagnose and get their butts to a doctor, to a psychiatrist who can help them um, get out of the valley of the shadow of death where I actually was. And the best way to do it, because people come up to me in Kroger at the car wash on Highway 96 and ask me about it and I don't have time to listen to their whole story. So I wrote the book as a sort of a self-help manual for depression. It's a survival guide to depression and panic disorder. And now I just carry them around in the trunk of my car so I can pass them out. There you go. Yeah, that's great. But it's a hideous uh, thing to have. It was beyond hideous, actually. I don't think there's a, an adjective for how bad it can get. It has a genetic component. You can inherit it from your relatives. Mm -hmm. um, I say I can't change my relatives, but I can change my thoughts. 
So I had to go back and do some hard work, some inner work about the stuff that I've never told anybody that's happened to me in my life. And by doing that, I felt a sense of freedom because I was like a detective looking at all the stuff and I thought, oh, that's why I have anxiety disorder. All five of my father's sisters had severe, extreme anxiety disorder. They never married, they never left their homes, they had OCD, their houses were unspeakably clean. One of them lived up a dirt road in a holler in Kentucky and wouldn't even go into town. She was agoraphobic. Mm -hmm. But anyway, when you go back and you start looking at your past and you start realizing, uh-oh, Aunt Watsika wasn't just weird. She had severe depression and severe panic disorder. And then you kind of look at yourself and start unraveling things that happened to you. Um, the book starts out with something that's beyond horrible that happened to me. And I had never even told my therapist about it. And he about fell off his seat when I finally told him what my first memory was at age three and a half. Um, it's really bad. I'll let people read the book and find out. All that to say, I want to help people. And basically, what I am, Stacy, is a communicator. I have to, I have to use whatever I'm going through to reach out and talk to other people. I used to be head nurse in ICU, so I know about the medical industry. I was also going to go on and become a doctor when my nona started singing on me. We had to move to Nashville instead. <laughs> but I have a medical background so that other people don't have to read these thick books or watch the videos or hang out with geniuses, which I did. I'm trying to translate for them. Yeah, put it in words that everybody can understand. Absolutely. I think it's one really nice thing about now versus back in the day. Like like you said, when your your aunt wasn't just weird, she had these problems that we just didn't really have words for back then. So I, I think it's just an awesome thing that you've written this. It, it's so hard to open up about this kind of stuff. A lot of why this is so important and talking about it is so important is it, the more it gets talked about is the more the stigma is broken. Um, I think a lot of people think that depression is just being sad and there's so much more to it than that. It's, it's an emptiness. And I think trying to get people to understand that who haven't experienced it is tough. And um, you know, this will help with that. The first thing you said about reducing the stigma, uh, people use words like crazy, neurotic, whatever. This is a, m a mental condition in your brain, you can't look at somebody and know that they're depressed. There's no blood test, you, don't, you can't do an x-ray. Just like the heart disease is a disease of the heart. Diabetes, which is rampant in this country right now and getting worse, is a disease of the pancreas, which is right here. The pancreas makes insulin. So if the pancreas has a disease and isn't making insulin, then you have to inject insulin or swallow a pill or whatever. So mental illness is a disease of the brain, meaning your brain doesn't make certain chemicals that you really need. We call them neuropeptides. That's a fancy word for the happiness ch chemicals, mm -hmm. serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine. Your brain, my brain, because of my relatives, doesn't make enough of the good chemicals. So I don't have them. I have to take medication and I tell everybody go to the doctor and get diagnosed and then, uh, they'll help you, he or she will help you figure it out. Mm -hmm. You also talked about stigma. You would not believe how many celebrities have called me. I will never, ever, ever say their name, but you would be stunned, like blown away if you knew the celebrities have been ringing my phone asking me to to counsel them and help them. And of course, the first thing I say is go get my book because it's laid out. Everything that you're going through, I went through and it's in the book. That's why I keep saying the book is really a manual for how to survive depression and anxiety. You have to read the book because it helps you identify. It's not just feeling sad. It's so much more. You feel like there's no purpose you feel so empty and the world is so dark. That couch in my kitchen, I couldn't get off my couch for almost a year. 
and we were talking about my dogs, Maudie, my big dog, who's my soulmate, my last rescue, would come over and literally lay, just put herself on my body and lay her face, her head, her big head on my head as if she was a blanket or trying to say, um, I'm here for you. Mm -hmm. It was unbelievably tough. There are not enough words to describe um, what I went through. And my girlfriends out here, I believe in, in friends so much, my beloved girlfriends would beg me to go into the little town and have lunch at the cafe or poke around the shops and I would swear up and down that I was going to do it, that I wouldn't be able to get dressed. They would show up, I would stand behind the curtain there in the hall at the door and just watch them. And I couldn't, I remember one time we were having a potluck over at Mary's house and I was supposed to bring my world famous potato salad. I made it and everybody was just like, yay, she's finally coming out of the house after months. And I just took it out and put it on the hood of my car. I watched them come and get it and they came up on the porch and rang the bell and everything. Um, I have seen every rerun of Law and Order at least twice. <laughs>So in 1990, at the height of the Judd's thing, mm -hmm. you were diagnosed with hepatitis C. Um, if you haven't had enough world-shaking health stuff, um, talk to us a little bit about um, how you dealt with that diagnosis and how you came out of that. Wow. Uh, you're right. Here we are on top of the stinking world. Five Grammys, well, actually one six for songwriter of the year we were undefeated at all the award shows the beloved fans had just changed our worlds i was on welfare i didn't have a car in l.a we were downright pitiful i got behind in my rent we were paycheck away from the streets every every month so for me to finally be able to buy a new car I remember the first thing I got when I got a royalty check from RCI, I got a set of Clairol hot rollers and garbage pickup. <laughs> that just goes to show you how my life changed. So here we are on top of the world. Um, Winona and I are grooving together, which was huge. I met Larry, who's been my husband now for 38 years. But all of a sudden, and this is the way life is, um, and I pretty much had rhinestones in my blood. So all of a sudden, now hepatitis C, which was incurable at the time, we didn't have anything for it. And the, the Mayo Clinic doctors told me I had three years to live, which really ticked me off because nobody can tell you how long you got to live. It's up to you. But after the eight years, this virus that had been dormant, uh, just laying still undetected in my body, surfaced. And I felt like I had the world's worst case of the flu. It was really bad. I remember one night, um, I just got back on our bus and my bus, my bed was in the back of the bus and I just literally collapsed on the bed and Winona had to take my shoes off, take my big fancy dress off of me and she was sobbing the whole time. And our bus driver, who was one of my best friends, came back and he saw me and he said, um, you're going to have to quit, aren't you, Mamma? And he said, I quit and the band quit and everything changed just like that. All of a sudden I came home and that gate out there, um, Galen 
drove the bus. One only got off first because she lives up the road. She lives behind that, on that, over that hill right there. Actually, lives over that hill. So the bus driver dropped me off at two o'clock in the morning, and I stayed until the last thing, and actually watched Albert turn off my spotlight. It's sort of a metaphor, like <clears throat> who turned off my spotlight all of a sudden. I was the last one <clears throat> to leave this big arena, and I was standing at the front gate with my little suitcase and my beaded gown over my arm. I remember it was December the 4th. It was a very frigid, black, cold night, no sun, no moonlight at all. And I watched the lights of my bus, the Dream Chaser, go down the country road. And I came in. I was in another state, another mental state. That was the night my depression started. And Larry got on the road with Y. He was becoming her manager. <clears throat> we couldn't hire anybody else but him because he, she was so messed up. But I remember the clock on the wall in the kitchen. We'd lived here a long time. I didn't even know you could hear the tick tock. I could hear my clock ticking. And I looked at the phone and the phone didn't ring for a week. Nobody called me for a week. The phone just, and I just stared at the phone. And I thought, my life is over. There's a big bridge. Um, it's about 20 minutes away. And it's super tall. It's called the Natchez Trace Bridge. And I thought, well, I was that sick. Mentally, I was that distraught. I was that far gone because I couldn't see another second. I couldn't, certainly couldn't see another minute. But it was that dark. It was that scary. And I was just swallowed up with deep depression. And after months, Larry finally, he and Ashley bundled me up. They called 911 in the middle of the night, and the guys um, came, and Larry and Ashley said, um, we have to intervene. You're completely gone. We've got to do something. Mm -hmm. And that's what I was diagnosed. And then they started trying me and all the medications. But everybody's, your, your chemistry is yours. And it's so different. And your brain makes chemicals and a certain amount of chemicals. And like they said, um, we, can't, we can't do a chest x-ray to see if you have asthma or pneumonia or anything. You don't have a broken arm. We can't see a physical disability. I just look normal. I look like Naomi, but the psychiatrists are trained. Well, I'm glad that you guys found help. You have to raise your hand, and sometimes we have to have somebody, and I'll, I'm maybe that one to teach you. You have to raise your hand and say, "Okay, this has gone too far. I can't go on. I cannot live another day like this. It's not just sadness." It's something way beyond where you don't want to live anymore. We'll be right back with more from Naomi Judd. Welcome back to our special presentation of More Than the Music with Naomi Judd. The book will help people become their own advocates. The book takes you literally step by step through what it was like before I was diagnosed, how I got diagnosed, what I did afterwards, and what I do every single day now. I have tools. Larry said I have psychological tools in my tool, psychological toolbox now. But every day I go through these certain steps and I'm sitting here happy, I'm content. I have more peace of mind, frankly, than I ever had. Not that I ever had it <laughs> in the beginning. My life was too traumatic and too tumultuous. Well, it's awesome that you've overcome that. Can you tell us a little bit about the tools? I was reading about the ABC, please. There are so many things, and they call a lot of the tools are called integrative medicine, which just means that they're not invasive on the human body. Um, I practice aromatherapy, acupuncture, chiropractic, biofeedback, exercise, the list just goes on and on and all these things, but you have to 
I, I joined a support group, which was huge. You're sitting there, and you've got the person next to you, you don't know, even know their name, and they say, well, this happened to me last night. I reached a point in my panic disorder where I became hysterical. I thought I was going to die. I didn't know what a panic attack was. I felt like I was hallucinating. My fingers began to tingle. I, my eyes became blurry. I was shaking violently all over. I had no idea what was going on with me. And I just went, oh, been there, done that. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. It's a panic attack. That's what they call it. It has a name. And when you feel like you're part of a community, the rising tide lifts all boats. You start to hear stories that reflect your own experience. And there is nothing in the world better than having somebody who's your rock, somebody who says, OK, be present in this second. Really concentrate on this particular second. Don't be thinking about what's going to happen. But that takes a skill. And through the years, I've learned the skill of um, the power of now. And I'm constantly reading good books. I'm reading a fabulous book right now by Eckhart Tolle, T-O-L-L-E, called um, a New Earth. And man, I'm underlining and highlighting that. I'll go back and read it and reread it. And it changes your world. It's not like that. Yeah, you have to internalize it and actually practice this stuff. I think it's it has to make sense to you. Yeah. I can, some of my best friends now are frankly geniuses. I study neuroscientists, I study the brain, I watch videos, I've been to these people's, um, girls and guys, I've been to their colleges, their universities, <clears throat> I sat through slideshows, boring slideshows. Uh, I just got back from the Libra Institute, which is in Baltimore, Maryland, it's on the campus of Johns Hopkins um, Medical School, and they study the brain. It's the Libra Brain Institute, and I actually saw a doctor dissect a brain, which was on my bucket list. but. They taught me about how the brain works. Then I went to uh, Hudson Alpha, which is down in Huntsville, Alabama, and studied genetics. They're some of the world's experts in genetics. Actually got my genome sequenced and then met with genetic counselors about, do I really want to know this? Mm -hmm. So my point is, I do all the grunt work, and then in my book, I say, OK, this is what this means. This is what your DNA does. Or this is how you know that you've got depression. This is how you know you've got panic disorder. But guess what? Once you see it and realize that you're doing it, you're practicing it, then here's my solution. So it is a survival guide. Yeah. I mean, between this and the integrative medicine and just, you know, medical doctors, mm -hmm. I think there's an answer out there for everybody. Medical and the ABCs are really about, um, Learning new stuff, because that's one of the things that kind of keeps me going. It's the carrot in front of the horse, horse's nose. I keep learning new things. Um, this is weird. But one of my friends is professor of theoretical particle physics at Harvard. Her name is Lisa Randall. <clears throat> and she taught me that there are other dimensions. They, scientists believe, astrophysicists believe, that there are other dimensions other than the three. 3D, the three that we know about. So learning about that, I realized it was a huge spiritual experience because I realized just how big God is. And I realized that anything's possible. And some of my other neuroscientist friends, just they continue to blow my mind. So I'm such a learner. And I look about all the cool things that have happened and still are happening, of course, and then I have a plan. If I know I'm walking, I'm getting ready to host the Grand Ole Opry. If I know I'm walking into a situation that's going to be stressful, because we do two shows back to back, and I'll be doing a book signing, and people will be spilling their stories on me, and I have to, because when people tell me their stories, I get emotional. And I can't do that. I have two shows back to back. So I think about how I'm going to handle that beforehand. Yeah, that's, um, 
It's important, you know. Gotta keep the makeup intact and all of that. Before you go Waterproof out. mascara. Yes, it helps. <laughs>
this is real stuff. But I would look out and I would see these people. I didn't know their name, what their favorite color was, whether they're married, if they're happy or lonely. But I would just assume for that magical time that we were all together. We all have the same struggles. We all have the same tragedies and triumphs. And it was the most overwhelmingly positive thing. And I know that's what cured me from my hepatitis C. I believe that music is the breath of God. I think it's a healer. When I was diagnosed in 92, 93, uh, and just given the death sentence of three years to live, I looked at the doctor and I said, how dare you? How dare you tell me I have three years to live? I'm a child of the Most High God. I get to pick it. You're giving me a, this is medical malpractice, man. You're giving me a death sentence. But if I wasn't a nurse and didn't know that you guys sometimes, sometimes get it wrong, I might be taking a six foot dirt nap, but you're not gonna do that to me. So like with a farewell concert, I was just, I felt like I was levitating, like I, I really was that far off the ground. And my Vera light, which is this golden pin light that was my particular spotlight, because one owner might be over here on the other end of the stage, she had hers, but I would imagine that the top of my head was off and this golden, beautiful, sacred light was just going through my whole body and I just felt it's the most amazing feeling I think that any human being can feel. And I've talked to other artists who also get it. And then, boys and girls, when Winona and I would sing harmony, she's my firstborn baby, and we would get to sing harmony together. And harmony is a third entity. She would sing the lead, I would come in with the harmony, and that creates a third mm -hmm. uh, sound, a third phenomenon. And we would just look at each other like sometimes like, wow, did you feel that? That was astounding. But I would have trouble doing the Super Bowl halftime. There may be a billion people watching us. And we could play Madison Square Garden and the Astrodome. and We could play every sold out crowd all year and not reach a billion people, of course. And we're traveling on a bus, and we're tired and worn out, and the bus is in a different city every day. And I thought, okay, how am I going to feel what I feel so that I can translate it for that little cathode ray tube called a TV and reach people all over the world? So I would have to go into a very prayerful uh, spell. My owner would say, don't anybody talk to mom. She's having a spell right now. I would do that before the show, actually, but I would have to transfigure myself. And also, if you're doing the Houston Rodeo, because they put you in a little uh, stage in the center of the arena at the Houston Astrodome. They call it something different now. And there would be dirt, where, of course, they did the actual rodeo around here. And you could just kind of see a wall of people. We sold it out with 78 million, 78 million, 78, it felt like a million, 78,000 people one time, and there was just this wall of humans completely surrounding us. But I could do it. I could get transform myself. That's surreal. I can't even imagine it. It is surreal, let me tell you. And also, when you do the Grammys, and you've got people like, um, the last time we did the Grammys, um, Jack Nicholson, because there would be people from Hollywood there, big time movie stars. There was Jack Nicholson, there was Sting, and Bernadette Peters in the front row, which is like <laughs> 10 feet away from where we were standing. Mm -hmm. And I just go, really? Is, it, is this a trick? Is somebody trying to spook me? I gotta sing live. I gotta sing Love Can Build a Bridge in front of my idols, and Bonnie Wright was there, who's my uh, idol. Aretha was there, because we had a dressing room next to her. She's mean. Really? Yeah, Aretha's mean. Oh. I know. Well. I'm calling her out. I mean, she and I get along great. She always keeps her door closed, and I knocked on her door, and her bodyguard, bodyguard said, it's Naomi again. She said, well, let her in. 
So I go in and I just kind of fussed at her. Okay. I said, come out here and hang out with the, <laughs> the peons. <laughs> and then there was one time when um, Natalie Cole was across the hall from us and she had to sing the national anthem uh, or some big thing. And she was just freaking out. She was about to call it off. And she told her manager, she said, get, the, get them to get the recorded regular version because I can't pull this off. And I went over and uh, prayed with her, laid hands on and all that kind of stuff. And she said, <sighs> okay, I got this. I'll never forget that as long as I live. You're one inspiring lady. Oh, yeah. Can I tell you something laundry I did? Sure. With Winona. I used to um, traumatize her. So the front of our bus, I'm just trying to put some comedy in there now for all this real heavy duty stuff. So there was a little tiny bathroom, just a half bath that just had a toilet and a sink in it. Um, and it, it was up there mainly for people that would come on to visit, whether it was fans or the DJs or anyway. I would take a balloon and put it in this little bathroom so it was kind of like at eye level. So poor Winona would, when we had company, she'd go in there. So she opens the door and this balloon w was right there and it would, it would suction thing and it would hit her in the face and she would scream bloody murder and run <laughs> from one end of the bus to the other. And she'd go, Mother, I'm not singing with you again. I'm going to sing flat. What are you going to do about that? I will get you. I'm going to get you on Dick Clark's bloopers and blunders and practical jokes. I'm going to get you. And then I would just calmly wait until she'd forgotten about it, however long <laughs> I felt that. Would then I'd do it again. If you could go back in time and give yourself a little bit of advice when you were just starting out, what would it be? I can't believe nobody's ever asked me that. Stacy, you're good. <laughs> Wow, that's amazing. It doesn't have to be serious. No, I think that, that needs a serious answer. I would say, I'm Naomi freaking Judd and I got this. I think that's my favorite answer to that one so far. I love it. Well, Naomi, thank you so much. I feel like I could sit here and talk to you for hours. And thank you for this book, y'all. Go pick this up, River of Time. It's in bookstores now, paperback. Um, it's been a special presentation of More Than the Music.